now we're going to shift topics now and, and really talk about what, what are investors looking for in aesthetics. And, um, and we have some fantastic folks here. Um, and I'll have them introduce themselves, but uh, Craig Drill, president uh, of Craig Drill Capital. Um, Bob Radigan, CEO of Mertz Americas. Um, and of course, you've met Arena. And Adele Oliva, founding partner of 1315 Capital. Um, so maybe let's just go down the list and, uh, and just briefly introduce yourself and, and the firm. Thank you, Josh. So Adele Oliva with 1315 Capital. Our firm was established. Uh, we had our first close in 2015, raised a $200 million fund, and now have um, $500 million under management, and focus exclusively on healthcare expansion and growth equity. Um, we love the aesthetic space, and it's an area that we've been passionate about for many, many years, and backing great teams. Uh, we tend to invest 10 to 30 million over the life and investment and have a guidepost of about a mi minimum of 10 million of revenue, but have also invested in companies with over 100 million of revenue. Fantastic. Of course, everyone knows Arena, but I don't know if we have anything else to add. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I had actually spent uh, about uh, 14 years inside the Partners Healthcare Organization, Mass General Hospital, and before that in Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So. My background is really on the early stage innovation, creating companies, deal making, and that's kind of in my DNA. Bob. I'm Bob Radigan. I'm CEO of Mertz Americas. I'm an outlier on the panel. I think Josh and uh, Grant just wanted to shake it up a bit because I'm on the uh, manufacturer side, not on the VC or uh, capital investment side, but can. Um, and have been asked to provide perspective on company mergers and resultant integrations associated with mergers and acquisitions. Thanks, we do, oh, sorry, one other item, but it doesn't compare at all in context to what you described, which is the other reason is Mertz does have what's called a venture fund. Uh, I think several companies do. It's nowhere near the size of uh, large pharma players, but we are active. Um, in the space, at least with respect to our size and scope, um, in some very early stage technology that we've uh, funded through what we call a venture, effectively a VC fund. Craig Drill, am I on? Yes, Yes, you are. Uh, Craig Drill, I run two small hedge funds, long, short, primarily U.S. stocks. What makes them unique is I've been doing it for 32 years. 25 years ago, I started private investing in aesthetic medicine where I've stayed focused. And a number of years ago, started two small VC funds to invest in aesthetic medicine. That's fantastic. And of course, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm uh, Josh Macauer with NEA. And um, we also invest in the space. Um, our general check size over the life of a deal could be anywhere between 25 and 75 million. Um, and any, it's one of the larger uh, venture funds in the country with about 22 um, or 23 billion under management, give or take a billion. So um, let's talk about uh, some of the uh, interesting companies that you've invested in in the space and, uh, and some of your experiences. Maybe we'll start with you, Craig. Uh, Craig. I think it'll be interesting to hear about, uh, you've, you've been doing it for a while, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of perspective. I'm, I'm really interested to hear some of the, the highlights um, that you'd like to point out. Well, my experience has just reinforced my initial feeling, which is to stay very simple. And uh, this is a very exciting industry. Even after 25 years, I find the current science very alive, very exciting. I would judge the industry still at being in its very early stages. And uh, the things we've learned, uh, we've made mistakes. On some of our mistakes, we've made the most money. That's the surprising thing. Uh, because it's amazing how gullible people can be when they come to invest in this industry, because wow. the industry has dreams. Uh, most of our investing that has worked is because we've stayed very simple uh, with the people that we like uh, who've had success in the industry over time and and staying with them has really paid off. Inventors such as Dieter Manstein and Rox Anderson, also David Fisher who runs dermatology at MGH, 
Also, an ultrasound I stick with a man called Inder Monk in, in Arizona. And then to stick with people who are proven, uh, I stick with Irina Ehrenberg, who's very gifted at the early stages of uh, uh, giving birth to companies and building companies. That's great. Do you want to share one of those uh, mistake examples? It sounds pretty interesting. Well, my biggest mistake but we made an awful lot of money with it, was in 1994, there was a crazy scientist from Russia who had invented, working at a small company called uh, Thermotrex, and he invented the use of microscopic pieces of carbon mixed with actually what turned out to be peach oil to put into a hair duct as a target uh, to remove uh, unwanted hair. In early 1995, the stock went public and it traded up to a market cap of 1.5 billion. Everyone was very excited about this new aesthetic market. Problem is it didn't work because <laughs> the laser energy hit the carbon particles very effectively and caused them to explode. But people were just learning about hair removal and when you explode the carbon particles, you change the photon energy into mechanical energy, which dissipates the square of the distance. That's not what you want. You want to slowly heat the area and destroy the bulge area and the papilla. Mm. So this approach didn't work in the next couple of years. Approaches came along that did work. And, and <laughs> that was exciting, and I was lucky. I was lucky because I did my homework and figured out it didn't work before other people figured out, including the management, that it didn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Adele, you wanna, wanna talk about your, uh, your experience in aesthetics and some of the, some of the highlights? Yeah, um, so I've been an investor for over 20 years and our firm has strong ties in the aesthetic area. Um, at prior firms, we were involved with um, a company called Skin Medica, um, and I was actively involved with recruiting Mary Fisher to help uh, transform that company, which she did quite effectively. And then I uh, met Craig Drill through Jeff Nugent, a close friend of both of us, while um, I was an investor in precision dermatology. And uh, most recently, our firm invested behind Mary Fisher again at Color Science, um, which has a just such a compelling group of products that deal with skin protection and health. And um, as there's more and more awareness around chemical sunscreens and the factors associated with them, it's just wonderful to be with a company focused on heavy science, physical protection, and um, great outcomes. Yeah, that's fantastic. And Bob, of course, I think Mertz does do some direct investing in companies as well, right? Yeah, we do. We um, relatively small in the context of each individual investment relative to you know what you described and likely what you guys are uh, providing. Uh, but we look, as Craig said, really for companies that have a simple concept that's relevant to our audience, so immediately adjacent to the medical aesthetics community has a, a really sound scientific uh, basis yet to be proven in the cases of the early stage uh, companies and um, also look at companies where we believe the product and the only way we will invest is if we believe the product offers a point of differentiation versus what exists in the market today. And when you're, when Merch is investing, is that a, a pathway towards an acquisition or is it to learn or what's the, what, when, when we see Mertz as an investor, what does that, what does that mean to us venture investors? Yeah, for, for us, it's mainly, it's not a path to learn as much as a path to potentially own uh, yeah. downstream. So we don't take a full mm -hmm. ownership position. Uh, we take a partial ownership position and dependent on the agreement with the respective company, either have right of first refusal or some other um, opportunity to, to take a, more fulsome ownership right in the company based on the milestones and gates that they pass along the way. Got it, thank you. 
And Irina, I know you're not externally investing, or are you? Are you acquiring or investing externally at all through the Blossom? No, we don't, we don't externally invest. Uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, we essentially prioritize amongst the full pipeline and internally allocate the resources for investment mm -hmm. um, as we go down the, lo uh, the line. And that, that determination is, uh, because we're so early in our process, is uh, very much guided by the disruptive science that we're working through. Got it. Um, and for us at NEA, we, we are typically interested in um, devices or technology that is uh, therapeutically oriented. Um, it could be an implant, it could be a, you know, a, a, a chemical, it could be a, a device, um, a tool, a new procedure. That tends to be our, <clears throat> our sweet spot and uh, Althera is one of our um, companies that, uh, you know, is quite successful in the space and doing quite well. So let's turn to, and I know there are many folks here who have small companies looking for investments, so it would be really helpful to have a discussion about what are the things that you look for? Um, how do you know it's something interesting? And you know, um, maybe some um, pointers on how to, um, re what would be the right thing to reach out to you with? Adele, you want to start? It won't be a surprise to anyone, but really the most important factor for us comes down to management and the management team. Um, they create massive upside for us as investors, but also save our bacon when everything doesn't go as planned. Um, of our portfolio companies, over half are teams we've made money with before. And we really look in terms of the business models for companies with um, commercially capital efficient business models. We love the physician channel and the ability to scale with 40 to 60 sales reps across the country. We look at repeat purchase patterns. Absolutely, Bob, a differentiated, innovative solution is critical. I mean, days are gone for the Me Too uh, potions and lotions. You're having more, just a much more savvy physician base the last 10 years, which is wonderful. And as a result, it's raised everyone's game. And um, I would say in this particular, we invest at 1315 Capital across industries of healthcare, but in this particular space, I completely agree, we're in the infancy, and there is massive, massive amount of momentum and opportunity. And what about stage or you know, other characteristics or criteria that would be good fits for you? Yeah, so uh, Josh, I am not a doctor, <laughs> and I don't play one on TV. Um, I am a business person, as are my partners and colleagues, and so we're commercial stage investors. We're looking for those repeat purchase patterns, typically a guidepost of 10 to 15 million of revenue, and um, we're trying to create outsized growth by providing capital um, behind the great management teams. That's great. Um, and any particular spaces of interest? Yes, a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, we definitely um, are very interested in capital equipment, but with a recurring revenue mm -hmm. aspect to it. Um, there are a lot of great management teams here that spoke today. Um, we also like the consumable area. I would say where we don't focus as much is on um, the retail channels. Mm -hmm. So. Although our companies are B2B, there is sometimes a consumer element, but it's typically a minority. Okay, that's great. Maybe I'll bounce over to Craig for a similar set of questions. Um, so Craig, uh, advice to, you know, what are you looking for? What are the things that um, would get you excited about learning more about a company when they come to see you? What I'm looking for might be a little different than what other people look for. I look for breakthrough science. I don't look for incremental steps, which a lot of the science is. I, something that's truly disruptive, surrounded by global IP. Uh, one recent investment has been in the ideas of uh, Dieter Manstein and Rox Anderson, and Arena's the CEO of the company called Avava, A-V-A-V-A. And they have a breakthrough on how to use lasers. And lasers have traditionally been columns of light where most of the energy hits the surface and then goes deeper. This is a 3D technology that can come in an XYZ pattern and focus deep. This can be used in microfluidics and in industry. It can be used in human tissue. In human tissue, it means you can 
for the first time ever, bypass with most of the energy the epidermis and go to the dermis. This can be done chromophore dependent or chromophore independent. It can be done over all wavelengths and all durations. If you used it for one application, uh, melanin in the dermis, so there are like seven conditions where melanin gets deposited down in the dermis. Some forms of melasma have this. You can't treat these melasmas in people of skin of color because there's too much competing melanin in the epidermis. But if you could just get that melanin out of the dermis, the market in Asia, South America, the Middle East uh, is huge. Avava also has other very large fundamental breakthroughs which are so important, I'm not allowed to talk about them. <laughs> uh, secondly, I'm doing- Which, by the way, is not easy. <laughs> so this is called managing your I, investors I you very tense, carefully. I saw you tense up a little, Arena, when I'm he was talking. I'm backing an invention by David Fisher, who's the chief of dermatology at MGH, who's an expert on melanoma and the pathways of melanoma. And along the way, he developed the ability to stimulate the melanocytes to produce melanin without exposure to ultraviolet light. Mm -hmm. So with the lotion on the skin, he can produce melanin or a natural tan without going into the sun. It looks like a natural tan. It lasts uh, like a natural tan. It also works as a natural sunscreen. Something like that is an example of a major breakthrough mm -hmm. uh, with people I trust and like. Very interesting. You know, it's interesting here you say that. I think I would probably, if I was saying for NEA, probably agree with Adele in terms of team being first, but you're talking about technology being first. Where does team fit in? Um, or is it just like, if it's a breakthrough technology, you find the right people? How, how do you think about that? I, they know, I, I must have both. Okay, M must be both on a company basis. And are you looking at new things from the outside or is it mostly just those experts that you have relationships with and you're sticking with the experts? Sticking with the people I know, but in mm -hmm. some cases, like my ultrasound man that I like so much in Arizona, we just, he has a series of inventions where we can use ultrasound to recharge a battery without getting near the battery. Let's wow. say there's a, a, a sensor inside a big chemical cylinder, so you don't have to break the integrity of it. You could, if you could uh, recharge that battery from the outside on what you like to do, Josh. Uh, this is, we also have patents for using it for uh, recharging a heart implant. Without having to go in and replace it, we can recharge it from the outside. That's super cool. And Bob, tell us a little bit about how the investing and also M&A practice is oriented and what are the areas and sort of criteria you're looking for to uh, lean in and either acquire a company or invest? Yeah, so probably uh, distinct from what you hear from other folks in the panel, we, we don't fixate on a proven management team. Mary Fisher is an example, but uh, we'll then follow and, and take that team into to new endeavors. So to us, it's, it's interesting, it's not a core driver. Uh, mm -hmm. Frankly, it, it's back to what I described earlier. Uh, a simple concept, relevant to the audience, well differentiated, and has some uh, proof of concept already. That to us allows us to um, consider things that come in from all different spaces, totally unrelated to medical aesthetics. Um, the one thing I would comment on that, that I've found interesting as of late is, you know, we're all talking about products, but I think in this industry, there's still an opportunity in the services realm uh, for people, and not necessarily Mertz, we're, we're fundamentally a product company. Uh, but if we can um, see investment in the things that will help people navigate through the spectrum of care uh, more easily, there's a lot of really good companies um, out there working on doing that and um, help consolidate things such as EMR and other areas, um, you know, patient financing, I know we've got folks in the room, uh, that have platforms in that area. Those are all things that I think would benefit 
everyone in the room, it's you know gonna raise the, the tide in all boats if we, mm -hmm. not just product-wise, but platform-wise, um, are able to drive towards some investment and innovation that helps make this a, a readily accessible, easy to navigate market for the consumer. And what are the areas that are, um, that you're looking for, and w are there any white space areas that the group out here might not be aware of that you'd like to see companies or technologies in? Oh yeah, you'd asked that earlier. So uh, three, probably not a big surprise um, to people who have been in the industry for a while, but um, our kind of top three hot button areas are cellulite, skin tightening, and hair loss. Mm -hmm. Anything in those areas we put a lot of attention towards. Can I, can I ask yeah, Bob a follow-up question? Um, so as you're thinking about hair loss, um, are you thinking about rejuvenation or more just reducing the loss? And, and part of my question is, as we, I've been interested in the hair um, area for well over a decade and have looked at countless companies. And one of the things I've struggled with from a business model standpoint is it takes much longer to demonstrate results. And so you don't have the persistence so can you just, do you mind sharing your insight there a little more? Yeah, and I don't know that I have you know, much more than you would. You've probably looked at a lot more companies than we have, but um, it would be both on prevention of hair loss, but the ultimate you know, big gold mine would be hair growth. And um, what and how that takes from a regulatory path to, is you know, to be determined. But um, ideally it would be hair growth, but right. certainly minimization of hair loss uh, would also be of high interest. You, know, you don't have an issue, so you're fine, but yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I will say. I've been taking this new medicine, well, I wanted to ask you guys to potentially consider <laughs> funding <laughs> some. Work behind. I'm kidding. The hair space is interesting because I find that uh, lots of folks are looking at the hair loss market. Um, what I haven't seen as many folks focused on is uh, the hair graying market. I think when you think about um, how much work goes on in our industry when it comes to pigmentation of the skin, managing both hypo, hyper, and every condition in between, hair loss is one condition of hair. And there is actually some phenomenal science that has advanced dramatically in a true understanding of why people turn gray. And that when we talk about prevention, I think that that is a, um, uh, area that is under-recognized and is very, uh, very much ready for an opportunity. You very pointedly looked at me several times no, when you were I talking about that, and it's <laughs> highlights, it's not grain. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's talk a little bit about the financing environment, um, because, you know, historically MedTech has had a little bit of a challenge, but, you know, aesthetics might be an area where, where things are, are different. How, and of course, you have your investors, but of course, you're in companies and who are also seeking funds. Um, how difficult is that? Um, is it a good time to be um, in a small med uh, or aesthetics company seeking capital, or is it, or is it challenging and why? Go ahead. Uh, massive, uh, massive opportunity. I think it's an incredible time uh, to be in early stage, mid stage, late stage. There are a large number of strategics um, interested in acquiring. What I, I found most interesting is the strategics are coming downstream a little bit into our market size and acquiring companies when they're smaller. Historically, they wanted more scale, over 100 million of revenue, so that they could either build a new vertical or tuck it into an existing division and have it be accretive. What we're seeing are the strategics doing smaller size um, acquisitions and using the power of their channel to really um, much more quickly expand and benefit from that growth from an earlier stage. So this is, I don't think there's a better time to be an aesthetics entrepreneur. That's really cool. Craig, would you agree with that? Well, let me just comment. I think if people are involved with uh, startup ideas and they're involved with arena and a very disciplined incubator, that's one way. But when you're not involved with someone like arena, I think you know raising a million to 20 million at the beginning is almost impossible. It's mm -hmm. really hard. Uh, I find that as an opportunity because there are not many people who deal in that space. Mm -hmm. And uh, people generally don't want to 
go to a venture capitalist at that time. Number one, it's too small for a venture capitalist, but they don't think they're gonna get the valuation for their ideas at that stage, and they think the venture capitalist will eventually take over control of the company, which is true. <laughs> it's right, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, but you're also seeing, I, I think one of the benefits of the industry is just the maturation of entrepreneurs who are now seeding and doing a lot of the funding, right? The half million, the million dollar seeding because it is a much more mature industry now. And so the number of individuals that can be tapped now versus 10 to 15 years ago and the expertise from those former CEOs who have done it before is very compelling for entrepreneurs. Um, but as, as someone who has to fundraise for a living and our portfolio companies have to fundraise, it's, it's never easy to get your first capital, Craig. It's a great point. And Irina, is your business model sort of uh, aligned with that in terms of earlier exit opportunities into bigger companies? Uh, is that, do you think that that'll be the major way that I, your companies exit? I actually uh, think that it will depend dramatically on the transformational nature of the technologies. Uh, as we see now, um, even our bigger company acquirers are willing to pay top dollar for true transformational technologies, but the teams that carry them forward have to go the long way. So you can't just take the shortcut if you want to have that multi-billion dollar valuation at the end of your exit. Our strategy is really to look for those transformations that uh, the sector is ready for and to make sure that the early capital is uh, the right capital. It has the right understanding of the science, understanding of the risk, um, understanding that f frequently the early management needs to be replaced by more mature management and you will frequently swap out the teams between um, the first team and the commercial team. And I think that that uh, nuance of being able to work on a board with a startup at that series A, even at the seed level, to put it all together and make sure the people at the table are productive, are thinking in, to the benefit and the maximum opportunity of the company. That's the fun part and it's also the secret sauce. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that chemistry will help you succeed in the long run. Very cool. And Bob, is it true, are you going earlier? Um, are you buying primarily, primarily commercial entities or are you going to development stage? Uh, much more development stage, yeah. Far less so, you know, immediately pre-commercial or, or commercialized entities. Our venture funds focused on early stage uh, development options, so. And what about on the M&A side, same? Or are you waiting until they get commercial to buy, buy the companies? Either way there. Could go either way. Pre-commercialization, commercialization, mm -hmm. but likely, if it's development stage, it's gonna be through our venture fund. Got it. You know, in some of my experiences with um, transactions and building companies, I've, I've found the bigger companies sometimes struggle with the development stage because especially if it's a, devel if it's a development opportunity that hasn't existed before, some, some big companies can really, um, you know, they're trying to fit it into an existing division or an existing call point or, and sometimes it's, it's difficult. How does Mertz uh, cover that ground? Yeah, and that, uh, that's a great point. Um, we look to, as I said earlier, a relevant adjacency. So it needs to be something that's pretty darn close to what our customer base is uh, doing today, not taking us, as, as you described, into the retail arena or areas out of our uh, core competency, which is medical aesthetics. Great. Um, maybe in our last remaining couple of uh, minutes here, I might just uh, have the panel give uh, a wor a w some words of advice to the entrepreneurs and uh, New co small companies out there um, that uh, might help them in their in their journey. Um, Craig, you want to start? Uh, just you have to be aware of uh, fooling yourself. Is this very easy industry to fool yourself in because the dreams are high? Yeah, I think that's a good one. I think you know we've all seen the the really high valuations paid by some strategics for a, a couple of companies that um, you know, maybe haven't pound, panned out as they expected. But having realistic expectations when you're seeking funding versus assuming that every idea, which today seems to be the case, is a one billion dollar product minimum, but being a little more pragmatic about it. 
I think one thing that I focus on is how do you make sure that you are really using your capital to the maximum efficiency, especially that precious early capital. Um, every dollar counts, um, how you spend it, how much you can achieve with it. That Between that A, first round, that seed, that A, and the next, everything is about uh, being very capital efficient to make the biggest impact on your technology uh, in that f uh, first round of value creation. And I think being um, incredibly diligent in that process um, and not wasting that time or money um, is very critical. Yeah, Irina, I completely agree with you. And the way not to have a venture capitalist own the company is is to be capital efficient, right? And really think through the spend of those dollars and the value creation that occurs from that. Um, the other thing I'd add is just business model. What is the business model? And is it a viable business model in this market? Another key piece in terms of how you're thinking through strategically, is this the right opportunity to pursue versus something else? Fantastic. And I'll just say, uh, stay grounded in your data and, um, and keep on working at it until you've really got something revolutionary. Um, with that, um, I'm going to thank our panelists. And uh, Grant Stevens is going to take on the next phase. Thank you very much, folks. Nice job.